and welcome to CHM. I'm Marguerite Gong Hancock, Vice President of Innovation and Programming, and I'm delighted that each one of you is joining us tonight. You know, here at CHM, our mission is to de decode technology, its computing past, its digital present, and future impact. We believe that inversity, uh, inclusion, diversity, equity, and access is important in everything we do. And so, in that spirit uh, tonight, we will be exploring the questions which are part of uh, all of the work that we do, whether it's in our collections, or our programming, or our education content. We like to ask questions about who's being represented, whose voices are at the table, who's making the decisions, who benefits, who's being impacted. And we're still early in our journey, but we are committed to this transformation so that everyone can help shape a better future. We're so grateful that the KPOR Center uh, are our partners and investors as we are on this journey. They have uh, provided s significant support for us uh, this year that will be ref so that our uh, inclusion, diversity, equity, and access will be reflected in our collections, uh, in our uh, digital exhibits, as well as our programming. And they are the sponsor for tonight's program as well as a series of events that will be happening throughout 2022. Tonight we are focusing on a truly lost woman of computing, Clary von uh, Don von Neumann. And she was unrecognized in her lifetime, but deserves now for her story to be told. It's been a great pleasure to partner with the phenomenal team of the Lost Women of Science, and three remarkable people are here tonight to tell Clary's story and also to explore what impact and relevance it has for us today. As is tradition, I'll introduce all three of them using five numbers. First, Katie Hafner. $182 was her weekly pay in her first reporting job at the North Lake Tahoe Bonanza. 4.95 million, approximately, the number of words written over the course of her career so far. 21, the number of New York Times obituaries of computer pioneers that she's written since John Postel died. One, time hacked into a prison to report a story. And 10, precious years married to Bob Proctor. Please join me in welcoming uh, journalist, author, host, and executive producer of Lost Women of Science, Katie Hefner. Katie, it's so good to have you here. Welcome. Next. Thomas High, 274,535 downloads of his historical reflection series in communications at the ACM. Nine years as leader of SIGSYS, the Group for Historians of Information Technology. Three awards for historical articles, articles since 2017, and 1,024 bytes of memory in the Sinclair ZX81 received for his ninth birthday. Two wonderful children, Peter and Paul, we're delighted to welcome back to CHM our Professor of History and Computer Science from University of Wisconsin, uh, Thomas. <laughs> Glad to have you here. Good to be back. <laughs> Last but certainly not least, Maria Chloe. Here are her five numbers. 33 years as the first female to hold her job. 17% of the first year class at Harvey Mudd that presents as black. 50% of Harvey Mudd's majors who are female 24 years of painting watercolors at board meetings. <laughs> 42 years of being married for the love of her life, Nick Peppinger. Join me in welcoming renowned mathematician, computer scientist, and scholar, Harvey Mudd's College, Maria Clawe. So glad you're here. Take it away, Maria. Well, I have to say I'm over the top delighted to be here with Tom and Katie. It's very exciting. I have um, a number of questions to ask them, and then we're going to have lots of time for Q&A from the audience as well. So Katie, I'm going to start off and just ask, what was the purpose and approach of the Lost Women of Science initiative? Let's see. Do you want the short answer? I guess so. so um... So we, uh, my co-executive producer Amy Scharf and I, Amy's in the audience, as is our entire production team, uh, <clears throat> we just decided enough was enough with, with all due respect, Marie Curie, Rosalind Franklin, whose niece, Rosalind Franklin, is in the audience tonight. And uh, 
we th our thesis going into this is that for every Marie Curie and Rosalind Franklin out there whose story has been told, there are scores, if not hundreds, if not thousands of women whose stories have not been told. So Amy and I were trying to figure out sort of how would we tell these stories and um, hey, podcasts are the thing. So we uh, decided to do po a podcast on, and to, what we do is we devote an entire season to the story of one woman. Because the way I look at it, you know, hey, if she spent an entire lifetime doing this work, we can spare a few hours hearing her story. Well, could we spare a few minutes to look at, at a trailer of this podcast? I would love to, thank you for reminding me because I would have forgotten. I would love for you guys to hear our trailer for season two. Do I know who Clara Van Neumann is? I'm embarrassed to say I've never heard of her. Wasn't she, did she have something to do with the weather? I've heard of John Van Neumann. I'm not even sure how to pronounce her name. Was she related to Newman on Seinfeld? I'm Katie Hafner, host of Lost Women of Science, where we explore the work and lives of overlooked female scientists. What Claire von Neumann is doing is helping to define what is possible on this new kind of machine. She ultimately became a kind of super programmer. Their stories are often untold, their contributions unacknowledged. Clary's role was sort of hidden because she had worked on the very secret bomb calculations. Women got to be programmers and got to make such a huge impact on the history of programming because that job was not seen as being important. In 1947, it was Clara and her code that helped make nuclear weapons simulations possible. Programming was this completely new discipline, so really everybody was starting on the ground floor, as it were. She always said she liked it because she liked puzzles, and this was a kind of puzzle. I mean, she's like at Los Alamos as someone with absolutely no training in physics or mathematics, talking one-on-one -on -one with Nobel Prize winners. And she was working with a brand new technology deep inside a world forever changed by the atomic bomb. There's this connection between death and computing that is inextricable. Join us as we seek to understand the origins of modern computing through one extraordinary woman's story. She was sort of there at the moment of creation. If you look at this as a sort of a cradle in a manger sort of thing, she, you know, she was holding the cradle. Season two of Lost Women of Science, coming March 31st. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. So I just want to admit, I of course have heard, had heard of John von Neumann. In fact, I think he is four thesis advisors away from me on my PhD lineage. But I'd never heard of Clara von Neumann. So clearly, this is really important. Tom, what was ENIAC and why was it built? All right. So ENIAC is the computer that Clara von Neumann coded for. So uh, ENIAC was created between 1943 and 1945 at the University of Pennsylvania. That was World War II. It was built for the Ordnance Department part of the US Army, and the Army had a particular problem. So World War II was a rapid period of technological innovation. They were producing many new designs of artillery. To use those guns, what they know is how far away they want the shell to come down. But the control that they have is to change the angle. And I think of this as the Angry Birds problem. What's the angle of elevation that's going to land the shell, well, traditionally on top of the pigs? And that turns out to be a very involved calculation. If World War II was fought on the moon, it would have been easy. They could have done an analytical problem with calculus. Unfortunately, there's an atmosphere here on Earth that makes atmospheric drag. They have to solve the problem numerically by essentially simulating the trajectory of the shell from one fraction of a second to another. And that requires a huge amount of computation. So the Army had several hundred women uh, based at the University of Pennsylvania, carrying those calculations out manually and with um, simple calculating tools. And that created the opportunity for um, 
some people involved with the university to pitch the sponsorship to create an electronic computer that could do that job much more rapidly. So I think of that as a killer application, both literally and metaphorically, because it was an application that was so compelling that they would produce an entire computer, in this case, the first electronic programmable computer to do it with. Um, that computer was programmable in that you could ask it to carry out a sequence of operations automatically. Uh, there had been previous programmable computers, like the Harvard Mark I, Bell Labs machines, uh, Konrad Zuse's computer in Germany, that basically worked from paper control tape like player pianos, but instead of playing notes, they carried out mathematical operations. Those were electromechanical computers using relays, and they would take maybe three seconds to multiply. So having them be controlled by paper tape from coded instructions worked okay. It was in sync with the speed of the machine. But the only way you can make them loop was to have a literal loop in the paper tape, and the only way for them to branch was to change the paper tape. So ENIAC had to be able to loop and branch automatically, but it had a convoluted, and even by the standards of the time, inconvenient programming method that I will not attempt to describe here. Did everybody get that? <laughs> can okay. I just say, can I just jump in and say, Tom, so Tom was our uh, go-to guy. So every season, we, do, we tackle a different field of science. Season one was medicine, and season two was early, early, early days of computer programming. And we lucked into Tom. So what I want to tell you is that absolutely everything he says is accurate. In fact, we had him read our scripts. And he would put these things in the margins. And at one point, he just said, we got something so wrong. I'm too embarrassed to even tell you what it was. And he said, Wikipedia is your friend, people. <laughs> <laughs> and our producer, Sophie, said, if we were in a class with him, we'd get a D minus. <laughs> and so now what we care about it in this podcast series is, is accuracy. And there's no one like Tom to get it right. Well, um, I think that's completely accurate. I think, however, it does need you and Amy and the rest on your team to sometimes translate it a little bit to make it Literally. more accessible. <laughs> Well, because we, uh, so in reporting the Clary story, um, well, first let me just say that the, the way we chose Clary, we have a database of now more than 200 women who deserve an entire season. And we go through this kind of thrash, figuring out who to do for each season. And Clary's name popped up, and John von Neumann was familiar to me, but I had never heard of Clara von Neumann. So I wrote to Maria who's the chair of our advisory board. And I said, do you know who that is? And she said, no. She said, a lost, truly lost woman of computing. And so we decided to make that our season two. And then we have to get the story and figure it out. And so what's interesting about one of the many interesting things about Clary's story is that her papers at the Library of Congress, there are 55 boxes of John von Neumann's papers and her papers are buried within his. And they're all in Hungarian. So, you know, and I'm learning Chinese. Yeah, so, so it was, uh, it, so we ended up and finding a Hungarian translator who could read this very loopy handwriting of hers that looked like a seismic readout. Uh, of, and also to identify Clary's handwriting, which is actually where Tom comes in, because he, if you see that first um, piece of paper with Clary kind of peering through it, that's Tom sleuthing and gumshoeing that figured out that that was actually her handwriting. Right, and the tagline for this season is, um, that she's the woman who coded the first modern code ever executed. And the numbers that you saw there are the handwritten code that was executed. Um, but I think you will need to, to say a little bit about Clara's story for oh, us. It's such, a, oh, it's such a rich, complicated story. So um, 
She was born in 1911 in Budapest to a very wealthy Jewish family. She had a um, very <clears throat> lively mind, and, but never had anything more than a high school education. And she was married a couple of times before she met John. And they actually had their first kind of rich encounter at a casino in Monte Carlo in the early 1930s when she was married to husband number one. And they meet at the bar, and they have this great conversation. And then he looks her up after his wife has left him. He's already at Princeton. And his wife leaves him. And he thinks to himself, I'm going to look up Clara, Clara Dawn. Her maiden name was Dawn. And um, so he goes to Budapest. She's, of course, married husband number two. She spent like five minutes between husbands. And, and they start uh, this amazing correspondence. And so she tells husband number two, sorry. Uh, I don't know exactly what she said, but it was something like that. And, um, and then she marries John von Neumann. And this is how she got to do what she did, because then she comes to Princeton. They get out of Hungary, and they get their families out on September, or like um, a day before Hitler invades Poland in 1930. And she get, like, makes it onto the ship. And um, they get their families out. And she's, there she is in Princeton. I don't want to give the whole story away because it's very dramatic and it's very, it's very um, layered. But the technical part of it, and I give a huge amount of credit to John, and I don't know where you stand on this, Tom, but uh, a lot of the wives, and we'll talk about this a little bit, this kind of spouse phenomenon of, of the wives of the scientists doing this what started out as human computer work, and then they migrated to coding during the war and after the war. He had total faith in her. She was kind of his Pygmalion. She had zero background in mathematics and zero education in that. And he kind of did this Pygmalion thing where he thought, right? He was like, what if I, what, what can I teach her? Wow. Was the experimental rabbit, right? She, she was his, moron. that's one of our episodes. It's called <laughs> The Experimental Rabbit, yeah. Right. So, I mean, apparently she was doing the first modern style code. I want to know, Tom, what does that actually mean? Yeah, so this is where the, the two stories interact, um, right? Your podcast is the Clara von Neumann story. The book that I wrote with Mark Priestley and Crispin Rope is basically the biography of a computer. And there's a point, it's about three chapters of our book, uh, where she is looming large as, in many ways, the most important character in this fascinating episode in the history of ENIAC. So ENIAC is 18,000 vacuum tubes. It's 2,000 square feet. It weighs many tons. It's 150 kilowatts of electricity. It's, it's hot. It's big. And it's reconfigured by wiring electrical circuits with a plug board between different modules. It's got 40 different modules around the room. And they're doing specialized jobs like adding, multiplying, dividing, square rooting. Uh, and it's got switches. So that is a method of programming that worked. But it quickly became apparent it's not the ideal way to program a computer. And the catalyst for that realization, in part, was John von Neumann arriving with the ENIAC team. And he catalyzed by those interactions, there's some dispute on the credit, writes what in many ways is one of the most important document in the history of computer science, a first draft of a report on the EDVAC, describing the basic architecture of a successor with the crucial ideas that underlie computer architecture. It's called the, the von Neumann architecture, the idea of loading code and data into a large addressable memory, um, the, the basic structure of storage and processing, a centralized computer architecture where you've got a centralized control unit and a centralized arithmetic unit. If you've done a computer architecture course, you'll recognize those ideas. And they are stated coherently for the first time in this document. 
So a lot of groups, including von Neumann's own group at the Institute for Advanced Studies, which you'll have heard about if you've read uh, Judge Dyson's book, Turing's Cathedral, um, are working to realize this and produce um, modern style computers model on this pattern. But it's a lot of engineering work. And those computers in practice are all years late. The hardest part turns out to be producing an electronic memory that can store thousands of bits reliably and retrieve them. So um, von Neumann's group in Princeton has weather calculations. Los Alamos has got nuclear things it wants to do. They don't have a new style computer available to run them on. And in 1947, when the idea of Monte Carlo comes along, which I guess you should uh, say something about. So Monte Carlo is where uh, it's kind of a co it's a coincidence that they that she and so Clary and John met in the early 30s in Monte Carlo when her inveterate gambler husband was gambling all their money away, and they and she and John s sat at the bar and talked. But then it's a total coincidence if you fast forward to Stanislav Ulam, who was um, who got very sick and was laid off, uh, laid up, and the um, and the doctor said it was what was it um, uh, encephalitis? That's what he had. Um, the doctor said, uh, "Don't think. <laughs> this is your therapy. Do not think." And so he couldn't help himself. Uh, he was a, another mathematician, a colleague of, um, of von Neumann's, and he started playing solitaire, and then his mind started going around like, well, what are all the, what are the probabilities? Of, and so this is, these, this is the origin of the Monte Carlo simulation method. It all started with Ulam, who then was spinning this out in his head, and he then did he bump into von Neumann or write to von Neumann? There was a correspondence between them. And I believe there was a long road trip or a, a long conversation between the two of them. Right. And, and then they came up. And so von Neumann, who was, I mean, let's face it, just flat out genius. And he took it and ran with it. And he had, in fact, already met the ENIAC, right? Oh, by yes. the way, can we just have a like slight timeout? We say ENIAC, you say ENIAC, and... Uh, I am just perverse, well, <laughs> because it sounds better to me, right? Maybe it's the English way of saying it, but um, <laughs> Bill Morkley... Um, we just need to go... This is the Computer son History and, Museum. Son and heir of one of the two creators of ENIAC says that um, his father and the rest of them said it ENIAC. And so, so don't copy me. <laughs> So we have standardized on ENIAC. Anyway, so von Neumann decided that this would be a really amazing way to, uh, to, to put the ENIAC to use. Right? Yeah. Now, who wants to talk about aluminum? <laughs> <laughs> um, All right, how about garbage? <laughs> <laughs> OK, enough. Right. So <laughs> and <the> garage? <laughs> <laughs> so the problem that Los Alamos had um, it's very easy to produce a fission weapon that will explode. You need a critical mass of uranium in two pieces, bang them together, it's going to explode. That's how the Hiroshima bomb worked. That bomb was so simple they didn't bother testing it. The problem was it was an enormous, spectacularly large industrial undertaking to produce enough enriched uranium. It took the weapon a millionth of a second to destroy itself when the chain reaction started. And during that time, only a little over 1% of that painstakingly enriched uranium fissioned. So post-war, Los Alamos wants ways to make more efficient nuclear weapons. And they could have made a bunch of them and tested them in the desert, which, which they did. But that would have burned through the entire stockpile of fissionable material pretty quickly. So they want to do, be able to do mathematical simulations and have something that says, if we have these design parameters, how big an explosion are we going to get to maximize the amount of weapons that they can produce with a certain amount of fissionable material. And your dream of science is someone like Einstein has an enormous blackboard. They scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll. And at the end, they suddenly cancel all the terms. And you've got this wonderfully simple equation at the bottom. And there were a lot of very smart people at Los Alamos, and none of them could do that. So the Monte Carlo concept instead is second to second, we can simulate what are the probabilities 
of different things happening to a neutron inside an exploding nuclear weapon? Is it going to crash into a nucleus at the right speed to trigger a fission? Is it going to be absorbed? Is it going to fly out of the weapon? Is it going to fly out and be reflected by a reflective layer? So fraction of a second to fraction of a second, you know the probabilities. But the pr thing is, how do you reason from that to something that tells you how big an explosion you're going to get out of the thing? And it's, they realized with a computer, it would be possible just to simulate that 100 different times and get a sense of the statistical distribution of the outcomes, which is the basic idea behind Monte Carlo. And it's now used, like Nate Silver tells you who's going to win the election. That's Monte Carlo, all right? How was the epidemic going to go? That's Monte Carlo. So it's used a lot. But this was the first time they had that idea. And the code that Clara von Neumann produced was the first time a Monte Carlo simulation had been done with a computer. Wow. That yeah, is we're... very cool. OK, I'm going to come back to the relationship between John and Clara. Oh, yeah. Because apparently, this was mirrored with several other married couples working on ENIAC or ENIAC at Los Alamos. So why was this so common in the 1940s? I'm throwing this one at you, Katie. Well, yeah, I pointed to this earlier, this spout, spout, the, the spouse phenomenon, um, and especially at Los Alamos, there were a few factors at work. One was it was wartime, and so women were, as we all know, the kind of the Rosie the Riveter um, model, and that's when there was a big burgeoning um, need for um, human computers. So if you've seen Hidden Figures, that was the group of women, mostly women, who did these calculations. And, um, and then as that work started to migrate over to computing, it really didn't, the, the women, and this is there's the famous ENIAC 6, the original programmers on the ENIAC, that didn't change because the idea unfortunately, was that this was work that didn't take much skill, fairly menial, almost clerical. And if you see the women in these photos, they actually look like switchboard operators. And then we get the impression that it was just sort of plugging things in and, and connecting telephone calls, which it was not. The, a lot of, and Los Alam, the way Los Alamos uh, figures into this is that it was a very difficult place to get into. It was kind of like the Roach Motel of, of, of um, science centers because you could go in and you couldn't leave. And so a lot of the spouses ended up at Los Alamos. However, a lot of those spouses were also, the women were trained mathematicians. Herman Goldstein's wife, I think Harris Mayer's wife, um, and Evans, uh, um, yes, and, and and so it's even more impressive, more impressive that Clara von Neumann, who had none of this training, w um, was brought in to do it as well. Yeah, and perhaps if I say a little about how her role evolved. Yeah. So you may be confused that I've, we've, we've said two different things here. The first one was that ENIAC was not programmed in the modern style with numerically encoded instructions. And the second thing was that she wrote the first modern code, and it ran on ENIAC. So how could those both be true? Well, they realized one of the things they could configure ENIAC to do was essentially emulate a new style computer. It had these banks called function tables that were originally for numerical constants that had decimal switches that could be turned to encode several thousand numbers. So they said, we're going to use those to encode modern style instructions, opcode parameters. It's going to be an addressable memory that holds fixed program code and arrays and you know, the other things that you do with a, a modern style computer. And the effort to come up with the configuration that's going to let ENIAC do that and to produce the code for the Monte Carlo simulation take place in parallel. Adele Goldstein and Clara von Neumann are both hired by Los Alamos as consultants to work on that. Uh, Adele Goldstein works more on the configuration um, side of things, and Clara von Neumann works on the program code. So originally, as you said, the, the Pygmalion idea, John von Neumann thinks that the job she's doing is going to be straightforward. They have a well-worked-out mathematical treatment on a flow diagram. 
and it's not a flow chart like you get later. It's a much richer mathematical notation that they think says everything you need to do. And they think that translating that to the program code, coding, is a relatively straightforward job, which is why someone with no scientific or mathematical background could do it. Uh, that's questionable, but her role finished up being much bigger. So in the spring of 1948, she is on site. She, Clary. Yes. Clara von Neumann is there on site with Nick Metropolis from Los Alamos, and the two of them between them reconfigure ENIAC for this new style of programming. They set up the code, they debug it, they simulate, I think, six different nuclear configurations as a test. They produce three weeks. They're, they're working around the clock, operating the machine themselves, and they send back the punch cards to Los Alamos. And we call that the first modern code ever executed, because that is several months before the Manchester baby computer in England runs what has often been called the first modern style code. There's a footnote to that, that it's basically code that's being executed essentially from a programmable read-only memory rather than from RAM. But if you look at the code itself, it's got a subroutine that's jumped to from several places. It's got branches, it's got loops. It iterates through a data structure. You look at the code itself, and it's unmistakably modern style code. And she is the person who wrote it and worked with Nicola, Nick Metropolis to run it. Wow. Well, That's fantastic. Wow is right. And also, we would not know this if this man had not, at the Library of Congress, found this piece of paper, which I would actually, if I'd seen it, I would have taken the gum I was chewing and wadded it up in this piece of paper. Yeah. And you figured it out by hiring a handwriting analyst. Yeah. <laughs> which is... I love it. So I should credit my co-author, Mark Priestley, who went really deep on the technical side, much more than me, and our co-author and project sponsor, Crispin Rope, who paid for the handwriting analyst, which is not a luxury a historian always has. Um, <laughs> but her role increased as, as they came back to do several more rounds of Monte Carlo including the first fusion Monte Carlo simulation in 1950. Her role expanded even more. So she was going beyond just coding. She wrote up the report to Los Alamos describing what had been done and the significance of the results that they had. She was going to Los Alamos to brief Nobel Prize winners on the significance of the results. She was advising other groups at Los Alamos that were doing Monte Carlo simulation on the programming techniques and even on how to get the physics into the computer. Uh, by 1949, with the third run of Monte Carlo simulations, I just wanted to read uh, a description here. So she was the one who was dealing on behalf of Los Alamos, making the logistical arrangements, setting up the machine time. And the description of who would be attending to run these calculations was Mr. and Mrs. Harris Meyer, Mr. and Mrs. Foster Evans, and myself to work with ENIAC. Mr. So, and Mrs., they don't have first right. names. Right. So the women don't get their name there, <laughs> but it's Mrs. John von Neumann. <laughs> and the two, it's like, it's like tennis doubles. <laughs> um, and of course, it's an interesting thing. Because <laughs> in many of these cases, the husband and the wife meet each other. There are also many couples that meet and marry around ENIAC. Um, but in many cases, <coughs> they, they're both aspiring scientists. The man gets a job, and the woman you know, comes along as a bonus and works through a, essentially a joint career. But the fascinating thing with Clara von Neumann is, as far as we know, she didn't grow up dreaming of nuclear weapons and physics and mathematics, but yet she is still functioning at that level. Yeah, absolutely not. I mean, we, so what we found was in her, an unfinished memoir um, uh, that she, uh, that she wrote, and she does not talk about aspirations of any kind like that. Um, and it's fascinating to me that she figured it out. And again, I have to give credit to him for having faith in her. What we do have is hundreds of letters. They had a very tempestuous relationship. She was extremely insecure, and it's letter after letter where he's placating her and telling her he believes in her and kind of like encouraging her to do this work and uh, and which is really I think remarkably 
generous and, and wonderful. And he didn't say, you know, why don't you just, you know, do the dishes, dear? Uh, so let me ask you, let me shift to a slightly different take on things. Why is it important to keep uncovering these new stories like that about Clary Dunn von Neumann? Instead of just repeating the ones we already know about a handful of now famous women like Lovelace and Hopper and the six ENIAC operators, why? Yeah. So one of the, the pieces I wrote for communication for the ACM was called um, Innovators Assemble. And it was a, a response in some ways to Walter Isaacson's book that claimed to be rediscovering lost women like Ada Lovelace and the ENIAC operators and Grace Hopper that you know, weren't necessarily that lost at that point, <laughs> right? I mean, it's interesting question. When, when, when does a lost woman become remembered? And it's, it's <laughs> and, and why do we need to remember them, right? Because clearly computer science, and, and, and you've done wonderful work to address this, but it has not you know, fixed the problem as a whole, has got dreadful problems um, in terms of gender participation, and opportunities for women. And I'm a historian, so I, I live for history, but most of you are more concerned with the present day. And of course, Lovelace and Hopper and a few others have been turned very effectively, essentially, into the patron saints for representation and opportunities for women in computing. Um, so I know why I want the other stories remembered, because you know I'm a historian, but I, I want to hear from both of you on this question, right? Why, why can't we just put up another listicle about Grace Hopper and Lovelace? Why do we need to dig in and tell these new stories? Well, I'm going to jump on that first. You jump. And I want to talk about somebody called Anita Borg. Anita Borg, yes. Uh. So Anita Borg and Telly Whitney is out here someplace. Wave Telly. There she is back there. So uh, Anita Borg, way back in um, the early 1990s, you know, started to think about this issue and felt that it was really important to recognize and celebrate the fact that we actually had many great female leaders in computer science. And so Telly and Anita actually started the Grace Hopper Celebration of Women in Computing. If I had it to do over again, I would call it the Anita Borg Celebration of Women in Computing, or maybe the Anita and Telly Celebration of Women in Computing, but whatever. <laughs> and you know, the truth of the matter is, computer science is a very unusual discipline in that women, not just one woman or even a handful of women, but many women played critical roles in the founding decade of this discipline. Now, I think one of the reasons they sort of got forgotten was that when the war ended, many of them got pushed out of their jobs. They had taken over these roles during World War II and they got pushed out. And, but yet, it was still true up until around 1980 that about 35% of the computer science majors were female. And I mean, in this room, we have a bunch of women who are computer scientists who are leaders in their field. OK, people out there, I can hardly see you, but raise your hands. Come on, <laughs> Carla, Telly. Carla. There's a bunch of you out there. Yes, thank you. And yet, in the early 1980s, these things called personal computers entered homes and schools. And oh my goodness, all of a sudden, computers became a boy thing. Has a lot to do with the computational constrictions of what those computers could do. And so what you could really do with them is you could play, you could do word processing. OK, I have yet to meet somebody who is really passionate about word processing. <laughs> <laughs> or you could play computer games. And what kinds of computer games could you play? You could play, you could basically track a projectile across the street. Okay, sports and shoot 'em ups. And all of a sudden, computers became a boy thing. And we have seen the decrease of women in computing 
go from 35% to as low as 14%. It's recovering. So from my perspective, oops, sorry about that. From my perspective, I want people to know that women, lots of women, and particularly this one, Clary Danver Neumann, were really important in launching the whole future of computer science. OK, over to you. Well, so I see it very broadly, because we go across scientific fields. Um, and we, at Lost Women of Science, we, we define science very broadly. In fact, home economics, which um, was an important for, for chemists who were women, uh, we look at that field and um, botany and, um, and all kinds of scientific fields. But computing, um, I see it just slightly differently. Um, I, I, there was the way that computing got um, kind of regendered. Um, much earlier than per personal computers, when, it, when software engineering became a thing, when it even got the name software engineering. That, so if you think, if you think to, back to people like Clary, who uh, probably couldn't have gone very far because she had no advanced degree, uh, and then when John died, it was a huge, not just, he died very young, um, and uh, she ended up doing his, all his collected papers and forwards to books, and she got completely lost in it, and she walked away. She actually walked away from it. We were hoping that she somehow continued, and we couldn't find any evidence that she did. And so, it was all these forces against her and a whole generation of women um, who were her contemporaries. But also, once it became less of a, quote, clerical job and turned into an, quote, engineering job, then that's when the men basically took over. Yeah. That's the no, way I No, it's not so. It's actually not so because women were still really active as leaders in computer science all the way up to 1980. They yeah. were, they really were. The so it's not, I mean, it's just not true that they walked away. They were pushed out of some of their jobs, but they continued to be recruited, and this is gonna sound ridiculous, because you still had to type punch cards. Right, yeah. But, but that, that didn't stop them from becoming some of the great leaders. So Francis Allen is a great example of you know, somebody who uh, was a, a huge leader in computer science, recognized throughout the world. But there's something else I want to say about the reason that we want to, we want to go, do deep dives into the lives and work of women like Clary, which is that it, um, one of the things that really pisses us off at Lost Women of Science is this great man theory of history and even great woman theory. And t Tom and I have talked about this, where it's Grace Hopper and it's Ada Lovelace, and they, and they feel like outliers. And there were so many. And so it's this way of shifting our understanding of how science is done. And it's not just kind of one heroine or one hero. And she was not, she did not, this is, she didn't invent anything. She worked with a team, right? Right, I mean, there's a tendency, I think, to tell superhero stories. In many ways, uh, publishers seem to think the only story that you can market to a broad audience about the history of science and technology is the lone genius who discovered whatever. And it has a lot in common, really, with a Marvel movie. Um, so I really um, like what you're doing with the podcast in terms of bringing home that like recognizable, vulnerable, human scale story. So um, human. She's yeah. not the lone genius who, who revolutionized the world. And in terms of I'm going to push models, you really hard on this. Because well, we're like, going to push back. Yes, that's fine. <laughs> that's what makes a, a conversation interesting. But here's what I'm going to push is, 
I totally agree with you that great inventions are almost never the superhero. They're a team. And if we look over and over again, we'll find the people on the team that contributed. But I think she was much more extraordinary than you're giving her credit for. Because she was somebody without the education, but she was able to find a way to actually work with some of the top people in the field and do things they couldn't do. So I think you're underestimating, uh, underestimating her. I think she had enormous natural talent that you're just not getting, giving her credit for. And I think John von Neumann's letters to her and messages to her really validate that. Yeah, they do validate that. That's absolutely true. OK, we uh, are I going to. I she had the talent, <laughs> um, but she didn't believe that. That's that the doesn't. Thing. There's lots of people who are incredibly talented who don't believe it. I spend half of my life mentoring people who are incredibly talented and lack self-confidence. Right. That's, not, that's not an issue of talent. That's an issue of self-confidence. OK, we're collecting questions for you guys. It's time for us to move, move to Q&A. Just before we move to Q&A, I have one last question for really both of you, but first of all for Katie. Why do we need the careful, laborious, and expensive <laughs> donors? <laughs> Expensive, expensive work undertaken by the Lost Women of Science team to tell someone's story accurately, including the paradoxes and frustrations of their lives versus just repeating parables about inspirational superheroines. Mm. Well, personally, I don't believe in inspirational superheroines. I believe in real human beings. Yeah. So that's my answer. I know. But and Katie, I yeah, want your and answer. You know, and we do. We we meet regularly to talk about the women who we will we want to focus on in future seasons, and we also want to start doing something that we that we're calling interstitials, where if we can't devote an entire season to that one woman, then we do, um, then we'll do like a thirty-minute kind of one-off, and we. Um, and, and our sweet, so if you look at a continuum, um, bear with me for one sec, if you think of the Lost Women of Science as a continuum, like um, the tens are the Marie Curies and the Hedy Lamars and the Rosalind Franklins over here, and thank goodness, and I'm so glad we have found them. And then the ones over here are the ones that are extremely distressing, where they are truly lost, and there just is not enough archival material even to eke out a partial season. Our sweet spot at Lost Women of Science is four, five, and six, the, the, the women like Clary. And so the reason we believe that it's important, as I said earlier, if they gave their entire lifetime to doing this, then we can spare two hours. But we have to do it right. And, we ha and, it, and it's, it, you can't just Google this stuff. I mean, we just, we go out there, we find, manuscripts in basements, um, we do a ton of interviews, we go to the, the Mount Holyoke colleges of the world where they went to school, we go through the archives, we go to the Library of Congress, we find our people like Tom, we, we, we puzzle it all together. But what we do is we then tell a story. And as a journalist, it's what I've always done is tell stories like in 4.95 million words worth. And that, is I think the gift that we give is this story of this person who you may not know. And I just, when we walked into this auditorium and I saw the, her name and I saw Lost Woman and I realized that we were giving her this, I was pretty, uh, I really was Pretty a cool. Taken. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you know, in a world of, of listicles and content farms and, and so on, it's wonderful that there is a project that can support real journalists, professional producers, people going to archives, fact checking, all the things, oh, the fact that, checking. All the things that are not present in so much of what is recycled from inaccurate secondhand stories about ENIAC and, and these other things. Um, so it's just been a, a real pleasure to work with. Katie and the team and, and see that kind of respect for nuance and historical accuracy, you know, that lets them tell a story that is, it's not, you know, Steve Jobs in, in a dress, right? It's someone who would not 
not describe herself as a genius, yet does these things. And I think that's the kind of story in terms of role models that more people can relate to. Someone who's insecure, you know, who, who maybe never fully comes to terms with herself, um, but accomplishes these things anyway. Yeah, Steve Jobs is not my favorite example of somebody I would want to hold up as a, an example to anyone. That's another, um, that's another evening. That's another evening, yes. Uh, I, I have my own Steve Jobs story to tell. Uh, however, I have some great questions from the audience. So the first one is, have you considered that her lack of education may have left her with a more open mind? Mm, wow. I love that. I hadn't considered that, and that's probably quite true because as you get more and more sort of narrowly educated, yeah. your mind starts to close down a little bit. I think it's true. It's also true in general. I mean, nobody who entered computing in the 40s or 50s had a degree in computer science, had a training in it. Everyone who came to computer science was coming from somewhere different. In some ways, I think it made it a much more interesting field because That's of still that true diversity. in the 1970s and early 1980s, that most of the people who came to computer science had a PhD in another area. So electrical engineering, mm -hmm. mathematics, physics, uh, all kinds of things. Yeah. So it, it persisted for a long time. But. OK, here's another completely different kind of question. Was there a different level of female participation in computer science versus the computer industry over time. Perhaps one declined, but the other stayed constant. So if I could uh, take that one. Um, there's no such thing as the computing field, particularly historically. So in many ways, what's happening with the famous women of ENIAC and what's happening here is a story about scientific calculation. And that's part of mathematics, specifically it's part of applied mathematics. Mathematics was relatively more open than physics or engineering to women. Applied mathematics was the lowest status part of it and was more open to women than pure mathematics. And the work of doing the calculations was more open to women overall. But then when computers are used, say, in the banking industry, none of that is really relevant. They conceptualize the work and the gender dynamics it inherits completely different. Um, so the computer industry, Right, is, I mean, IBM is a company, say, that had its own traditions. Software have their own traditions. So I tend to see the story of the gender dynamics being, in many ways, these separate parallel stories that play out differently in different areas, rather than there being one story of women in computing that is true across all those different Yeah, I think areas. that's true if we say women in computing. But I think if we say the computer industry, IBM is the computer industry and banks aren't. And, um, and, and scientific calculations aren't the computer industry either. And one of the things that's very interesting about IBM is it was one of the most foremost companies in terms of promoting women and people of color into leadership roles. And if you meet anyone of my age who's a leader in, in computing, there's a very good chance they were at IBM at some point in, in their career, which was certainly true of me. So, you know, I, it's, I, the place we saw the decline was actually in academia in the sense of, not in terms of faculty, but in terms of computer, you know, students entering college and deciding not to major in computer science. That's where the decline actually happened. Right, and the fascinating thing with computing is, it's following the same kind of trajectory as other STEM fields, as you say, up to the early 80s. And then in other areas, the participation of women continues to increase. And in computer science, it nosedives. Exactly. And that's I, uh, what's really interesting. So within North America, of course, the timing is exactly the entrance of, of personal computers in schools and homes. If you look at a country like China that didn't have personal computers because there were uh, or, or Eastern Europe for that matter, because there were restrictions on uh, sharing that technology with uh, communist countries, the decline came later. It didn't come until personal computers were allowed to enter those countries. So there's, there's at least, it's not causation, but there's a correlation there. Okay, next one is, 
Has the paucity of computer scientists who are women contributed to what is described as a misogynistic culture in high-tech firms? <laughs> <laughs> who would think that? If yes, do the end products of these creators impact the minds of the end users in a similar manner? Oh, God. Right. Oh. So loaded. Yeah. But I mean, Katie, you've spent a lot of time in these circles. Can you? Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, uh, absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, and Carla Broadley, who's in the audience, is working very hard to reverse that with, if I might plug you, Carla, the, yeah, go ahead, yeah, go ahead. Um, the, with her Center for Inclusive Computing at Northeastern, which, uh, and, I, and I followed Carla around um, on Friday to San Francisco State, to, to, which is one of her grantees, to watch her in action, really trying to get to exactly what the problem was with which, and Maria, you've done so much of this, with the mindset and the psychology and the women who shy away from it, but that, so that's in academia. But the whole Silicon Valley culture, I, I can't even begin to think how that starts to um, change. When I was a, a cub reporter and was, um, I had this funny fantasy. I was, I was covering Apple in the 1980s and um, I remember where I was. I was in the, the BART parking lot in Berkeley, headed into my office as a reporter covering Apple. And I had this weird fantasy moment where I thought, I want to be an engineer at Apple and I want to be a star. <laughs> I don't know why I thought that. And then I had this whole fantasy of hanging out with the Steves and the this and the and I had no understanding then, when I was in my 20s, that that actually could never have happened. And it's still... Well, in 1980, it could have happened. It, well, late 80s, late 80s. <laughs> um, we were getting, it was, things were getting pretty bad. And, um, and it remains intractable, it remains largely misogynistic. And, um, and, and shame on us. Well, let me talk about um, Harvey Mudd for a moment and about something that Telly is doing in collaboration, Telly Whitney is doing co in collaboration with Harvey Mudd. So at Mudd, we have been 50% female in our CS major for more than a decade. Um, and we're also 50% female in our engineering and our physics. And in fact, almost all of the work that has been done on inclusive computing is built on work that started at Carnegie Mellon and the University of British Columbia back in the mid-1990s, where we were able to demonstrate that if you change how you teach computer science, you can have lots of women majoring it and be thrilled. Now, of course, the question is that what happens when you take students who've done four years at a college where half of the women faculty are female, and half of the women majors are female, and they go out into industry, and they're into places where 15%, 13%, 12% of the software engineers are female. So anyway, Telly is and Harvey Mudd are doing a project together to sur survey graduates, both male and fe female, over the last 20 years, is that right, Telly? 20 years. Um, to find them, because we want to ask the people before, because when I arrived at MUD, it was only 10% female in the CS major. And what we want to know is, what was their experience after they went to grad school, went into industry? And one of the things, I just to follow up on that, so one of the people who we've connected with is Margot Lee Shetterly, who did, who wrote Hidden Figures, and uh, and she has her Human Computer Project, that and we're we're hoping to work with her to expand that. And uh, one of the things she said is when she gives talks, she, everyone says, why are we still having this conversation? 
And her hope and dream is that we will fix things to the point where we're no longer asking that question. Well, and there are, I would say at this point, at least 20 universities in the US and a bunch of Canada as well that have very significant percentages of women in their CS major. So, you know, it's not all bad. It's just that we need more. So um, I have one more question and then a more general question. So this question is, did Clary improve the metropolis hasting algorithm, i.e., should, should it be called the Clary Dan von Neumann metropolis hasting algorithm? <laughs> Uh, what? I mean, Tom. <laughs> I think I Googled that algorithm, but I have forgotten what it was. <laughs> can, I, can I jump in here? So this, should, it should actually be called the Ariana Rosenbluth Metropolis Hastings algorithm. Thank you very much. So excuse me while I get a little angry. Um, <laughs> Go for it. A, okay, a year or so ago, this woman named Ariana Rosenbluth died, who got her PhD from Harvard slash Radcliffe when she, uh, in physics, when she was 21 years old in 1949. And she married this guy named Marshall Rosenbluth. They worked at Los Alamos. You know the story. And she died about a year and a half ago, and, um, or not even. And the question was, do we do, one of the things I do for the New York Times is obituaries. And there was this big thrash. And it turns out that she had written the code for the Metropolis, the Metropolis Hastings. Hastings. And, and she had been completely lost. And, the Times was like, well, do we do it? And the, the, the men, who, the editors, said, I don't really think this rises to the level of an obituary. And I pushed back. And please go Google Ariana Rosenbluth and what she did um, for that particular So did album. they publish the obituary? Oh, they did. Yeah, they did. But it's, her stuff has been completely basically lost. So this was a few years later on the Maniac, right, when Los Alamos got its own computer. Correct. So that was the end of them needing to come and run things on ENIAC. And in a way, it was the end of uh, Clara von Neumann's direct career. But they were still writing to her uh, for her advice on coding the same kinds of routines yes, for the were. new computer. And I know the group currently at Los Alamos uh, wrote to me and asked for a copy of my poster with the flow diagram and bits of her code there. So I know that the people right now who are using the very, very distant descendants of that code still recognize uh, the significance of what she did and the way that they've built on that original work over time. <sighs> so, but we do it, you know, one woman at a time, you know, one time, so bit at a time, one season okay. of so I have a suggestion for the audience. Okay, you're all here because you think it's important to hear the voices of women and acknowledge what they do. Right? right. Nod? Yes. Okay. <laughs> all right. So, uh, we have an action item for every single person here. Number one, tell somebody about this. I mean, tell somebody about Clara Dan von Neumann. Clary Dan von Neumann. Tell somebody about, say her Ar name again. Ariana Rosenbluth. Ariel Rosenbluth and the Metropolis Hastings algorithm. Tell people that when you go to a meeting and you notice that a woman has suggested a really good idea and nobody heard it, <laughs> what I always ask people, particularly men at the meeting, is, Repeat it, <laughs> and, and when they say, oh, that's a good idea, say, oh, yeah, Katie said it first. <laughs> I mean, if we're going to change this, I mean, as Katie says, it's ridiculous that we're still doing it. Here we are in two... 2022. 2022. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out if that's really the year we're at. It is. I mean, I remember having this conversation back in 1990. 
with a group of students from 11th grade, and I asked them, how many of you, one of them said something about a physics teacher telling uh, her class that girls couldn't be good at physics. And I'm going, this is 1990. How many of you heard that? There were 60 of them. How many hands do you think went up? Uh, I think actually all 60 raised their hands that they had had some teacher at some point in high school tell them that girls couldn't be good at something or other. So here we are now, that's, you know, this is 32 years later. We have to fix this. This is a time for action. This is a time where it just really matters that people clamor. So one of the ways you could do that, so there's a couple of things you can do. I have two books here. Uh, there's gonna be somebody downstairs who's actually signing copies if you want them. Who might or might not have written it. <laughs> I have a podcast that's coming out that needs lots of PR, okay? Well, you guys are good at PR. So, let's celebrate what we have had this evening. And I think this was, I mean, I gotta say, I'm so grateful to be here with Katie and Tom. They are amazing. I mean, we really have probably the world's best computer historian Easily. with us this evening and we definitely have the world's best storyteller. <laughs> and I just want to mention that Katie has a novel coming out July 12th that's called The Boys. The Boys, thank you, for me. You're, You're hired. So yes. you novelized the Amazon show? <laughs> <laughs> I had the title before, you know, you write a novel, you write a book and it's like years and years, so I think I had the title before that Amazon show came out. But the weird thing is that The Boys, as a title, for a book, you know, there's like the boys on the bus and the boys in the band and... But the boys, the just the boys hadn't been taken. Just the boys. Okay, yeah. all right. Oh, and can I just say it's really fun to make stuff up? <laughs> 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 all right, so um, now I'm gonna ask the last question. And okay, just in case you guys wondered, yes, this was prearranged. So, as part of the Computer History Museum's One Word Initiative, each of us were asked to write down one word of advice for a person starting out in their career. Can you share your one word and story behind it? So, Katie, you're gonna go first, then Tam and I'll, then Tom and I'll go last. Do we say why? We, yeah, yeah. Oh. Your right. story about why it's important. Oh, why it's, oh. So I chose curiosity and kind of self-evident, right? Um, if you're not curious about what's happening around you, then you don't get the stories. And that's why I chose that. Tom. All right, so uh, I chose empathy uh, in, in connection with my work as a historian. So we're in a cultural moment where the idea of telling somebody else's story is often seen as problematic because you can't speak you know, for the experience of other groups. But as a historian, it's what you have to do. Uh, we're writing about people who lived in the past. The past, you know, famously, it's a foreign country. People do things differently there. So even if I was writing about, you know, a straight white guy of the right age from England, they would still live in a different world and think differently from me. And of course, I can't write a story that's only full of people who are exactly like me. I have to write about people like Clara von Neumann. I'm not going to say, oh, I, I can't tell her story for her. But I think we owe all the historical characters we write about the effort to try and understand the world as they saw it, um, to understand what they thought the meaning of their life was, and to understand why what they did made sense to them. And to do that, you need empathy, and I think it's a good quality in other contexts also. Well, and mine is pivot. <laughs> and, and so uh, the background for this is, is sort of twofold. One is, um, I just want to tell you, if you ever want to be a college president, don't do it during a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> it sucks. But one of the things that got us through it at Harvey Mudd is that Andrew Durantes, who's our treasurer and CEO, um, he came up with these two words to guide us through the pandemic. They were pivot and grace. Pivot. It's because everything is uncertain and you have to change constantly. Grace is 
People are really grumpy and stressed. Show grace. Well, that's the pandemic reason for this. And hopefully, no person starting their career will ever have to face another pandemic. But the reason I, I really use Pivot is I finished my PhD in mathematics in 1977. I solved three 20-year-old problems in my PhD thesis. There were 1,000 people applying for jobs as tenure-track faculty in mathematics. There were in, this is in all of Canada and the US. There were 20 tenure-track jobs. I got one. It sucked. <laughs> I hated it. OK, it was 25 miles north of Detroit. I was single. I went on one date the entire year I was there <laughs> with somebody I hated. <laughs> I mean, I was lonely, et cetera, et cetera. I went to conferences because I, was so, I felt so isolated. So I went to a conference every month. And at one of them, I was hearing from somebody who, whose work I knew well in combinatorics. And he was talking about he, how he had all of these graduate students who had offers from Bell Labs and MIT and Harvard and so on. I'm going like, wow, they must be incredible. And he goes, no. They did their PhD in computer science. And I went, I did my PhD in math. And I'm at Oakland University, north of Detroit, and hating it. And he said, well, let me tell you about this guy, Andy Yao. So for those of you who know Andy Yao, he won the Turing Award in 2004. He actually did his PhD in theoretical physics at Harvard, did a postdoc at Stanford, two not so bad places, realized the job market was terrible in theoretical physics, and went and did a PhD at UIUC in two years in computer science and had an amazing career as a computer scientist. And so this person is telling me, just go do a second PhD in computer science. Pivot. <laughs> well, uh, I actually did do that. I went to the University of Toronto. I um, was hired as a faculty member. I never finished my second PhD. I was hired with a fac as a faculty member at the University of Toronto, which for those of you who don't know Canada well, it's one of the top 10 computer science departments in the world. And I never finished my second PhD. So I guess the, I love empathy, I love curiosity, but I also think one of the things that's really important is pay attention to what the world needs as well as what you love. If you can find the intersection, mm. you're gonna be really successful. Mm. Mm. So I did the same thing in reverse, going from computer science to history. And uh, well, I told you I was perverse earlier, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Polymorphously. <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining us. Please join me in giving our two panelists a huge round of applause. Katie, Tom, and Marie, what a pleasure to be with you tonight. We have, we've gained a lot of learning to know Clary and your examples of curiosity, empathy, pivoting, and grace have given us much to think about. I'm gonna ask each of you to help the museum in two ways. We are committed to education and uh, ways that we can make these kind of public education events possible are through membership, so please, Join and give on the back of your program. There's a QR code. We also are intensely interested in learning how we can do better. So there's a survey uh, there for you to fill out. We'd love to hear your input about this. Um, that will help us in future programming. Last but not least, Tom will be downstairs and uh, to sign books if you're interested. And do listen to the full story of Clary with this season of Lost Women of Science. Thank you again for joining us here at CHM. Thank you.